do is uh, we're going to talk tonight about the rights of the Catholic Church, and it's interesting to me, Holy Spirit intervenes here, that Olivia started off by making the comment, uh, or by in her prayer, it wasn't comment, it was part of her prayer, that she said, help us to be attentive. I love those words, because in the Eastern Rite, the last two words that are said before the Gospel is read is be attentive. The deacon will stand up and say, uh, wisdom, be attentive. You're about to hear some words of wisdom from the scripture. Be attentive. So that's a good place for us to be tonight, maybe to be attentive. So um, to get us into this a little bit, uh, I'm finding that um, there is a lot of misunderstanding out there about the Eastern Rite or the other rites, really, of the Catholic Church. Um, and that's not unusual because it's not something most of us were exposed to growing up. You know, once in a while we were, right, Gia? But, but not everybody was. And so we kind of look at it in different ways. Let me ask just for a quick show of hands. How many of you have been to... Um, a mass, a divine liturgy in a um, in a rite other than what we typically do here at St. Thomas. You've been to an Eastern rite, Byzantine rite, etc. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so about a fourth of us. Um, so that's a little bit unusual. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight is a little bit about what that rite is like, where it came from, and why there are different rites, R-I-T-E, uh, in, the, in the Catholic Church, um, because they certainly have developed in a lot of different ways over time. So i got three questions that I want to ask you. If you attend an Orthodox church on a Sunday, does it count as your Sunday obligation to attend Mass? Yes, no, or it depends. So in the room just now, 45% of you said that it does not count. Or, or it does count. Or it does count. 42% said it depends, and 13% said no, it doesn't count. Interesting question. We'll return to that question. <laughs> yeah. See, first first lesson of teaching a class, cliffhangers. <laughs> leave, them, leave them wondering. Don't give the answers. Man, it's no fun. All right, so here we are. Next one. Your second question is, if you attend an Eastern Rite Catholic Church on a Sunday, does it count as your obligation to attend? Yes, no, or it depends. Survey says... 74% say yes, 6% say no, and about one-fifth of you say it depends. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Here's your last question. If you attend an Episcopal or Anglican church on a Sunday, does it count as your Sunday obligation? Yes, no, or it depends. 7% of you say yes, 93% no, and nobody said it depends. Okay. Good. So we need to we need to not only address the answers to these questions, but a little bit of where they came from and why the answers make sense in light of our Catholic faith. So that's what I want to dig into a little bit, and we'll come back and we will visit each of the of the answers, but in kind of a different way. So I want you to kind of think a little bit about that as we're considering some of the pieces. So, a couple of things in terms of sort of definitions for us to think about. First of all, um, a common question is kind of what is the difference here when I hear these things? Ordinarily, when you hear the word Catholic, most people assume it to be the Latin or the Roman rite. That's what we experience at St. Tom's that every Sunday is the Latin rite or the Roman rite. It means the same thing. Um, so, when you hear the word Catholic, that commonly comes to mind. When you hear the term Eastern Catholic, it refers to other rites that are also Catholic, every bit as Catholic as we are, but they celebrate the liturgy in different ways. And we'll look a little bit more specifically at that too. When you hear the term Orthodox, Orthodox refers to the faith that we split from, that really went two ways, I'll talk more about that in a minute too. Um, back in 1054, you guys all heard of the, of the Great Schism? So 1054 is when that happened, um, and the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church split separate ways. So an Orthodox, um, the Orthodox faith is not Catholic. It's split from the Catholic Church. They don't follow Rome, and it's a, it's a different ballgame. Um, so Catholic and Eastern Catholic kind of fall into the same category. Orthodox is in a different category. And so it begs the question of what do you mean then when you say the right? What is a right? 
So here is one definition of it that comes from the New Advent website. The Christian right comprises the manner of performing all services for the worship of God and the sanctification. So the manner of performing services, meaning the way that the liturgies are carried out, and specifically in terms of the sacraments, Holy Eucharist, etc., is the most important of them all, um, how the liturgy of the hours is prayed, and all other religious and church functions. So we think of it as a different right means just a different way of doing it, different way of doing business. Um, I guess it would be no different from um, if you're, you know, I coached my sons in, in baseball, Little League, you know, all the way when they were growing up. And um, as you go from one league to the next, there are different rules that you play by. You know, in some leagues you can lead off and in some you can't. In some leagues you can steal and in some you can't. The little kids, the coach is pitching and then the coach doesn't pitch anymore. The rules change, but the baseball is the same. You're always playing the same game but you're just playing with slightly different rules. So somebody that's watching the game might watch that game and say, oh, that's interesting. So I guess when you play baseball, the, the players never actually pitch. It's always the coach that does that. No, only if that's the only game you've ever watched. But if you go to another game, you'll see the players pitching also. They're playing the same game, but they're playing it by some different rules. That's what the rights are in the Catholic Church, different rules, different ways that we play the game, even though we all fit under that same category. So historically, this is kind of the, this is a really oversimplification, but I think it gets the idea across. So think of it this way. Back here at this end of the graph is Jesus. And he establishes the first church, and he establishes his first pope, who was Peter. So he, he tells Peter, you're my rock, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church. And Peter starts out, and he, he gets the church going. And little by little, the church picks up steam, and it continues to pick up steam. Although an interesting thing happens, that as the church is going along here through time, some local regions started to pick up some traditions in terms of how they celebrated the liturgy that might have been different from other regions. But that was okay, because everybody was Catholic. And actually, the interesting thing about that, as you think about it that way, they weren't calling themselves Catholic initially, but they were, and we get all the way here to the year 1054, which is the, the, um, the 11th century, and that's when the Great Schism, the, the division in the church happens. To me, that's just a really fascinating thing to think about, that the Catholic Church was the original church, and for 10, uh, uh, one, uh, one entire thousand years, 1054, it was the only church. Okay. Um, but just make no mistake about it, even though it was just one church, there were some different traditions within. And so some places would celebrate their liturgies in slightly different ways than other places. The mass started to develop in terms of a kind of a standard way of, of celebrating liturgy by about the third century, even though they were still doing things that were actually practiced back in the first century. The idea of breaking bread and sharing the word, liturgy of the Eucharist, liturgy of the word, has been exactly the same thing since Jesus broke bread at the Last Supper. It's always been the way it's been done, okay? So, um, but there were slightly different traditions. Okay, so we go along to here, and in the year 1054, there's a big fight that goes on between the East and the West, and essentially what happens is that the Western Church was, was focused on Rome. Rome was the, the capital, right? And everything was kind of under Roman rule. In the East, Constantinople, became another center, and in fact, Constantinople, which is kind of current um, day, modern day Turkey, um, over there, um, it became sort of, Constantinople became known as the New Rome. Like all of the power started to be over there. And so people were sort of going back and forth. Some were really sticking to Constantinople, and some were really sticking to Rome, and you had this little division that started to happen between the East and the West. And all of a sudden, the people in the East started to say, we really don't buy everything that you guys are doing in the West. You've got the Pope who is overseeing the church, but we're over here in Constantinople. We've got our own leadership and we really don't need Rome anymore. And so a lot of other things happen that would take us days to talk about. But the bottom line is, through much discussion and much argument, eventually in the 11th century, there was a split. The split happens and so the Catholic Church continues on. That's the red line here that keeps going. But at the same time, the Orthodox Church split off. Now, it depends on who you talk to. I remember one time I was talking to, I put my foot in my mouth. I was, well, I was much younger. I still put my foot in my mouth, but I, I just want to make it that clear. But at any rate, I was having a conversation with a Greek Orthodox priest, and I made the remark to him. I, I said, it's amazing how things have changed since you guys split 
off from the Catholic Church. And he said, actually, just to be clear, you split from us. But, you know, in some ways, he's kind of right. I mean, there was one church, and we split. And he's popped up the debate. Did we split from them, or did they split from us? I don't know. But what we do know is they split. Okay? So you get the Orthodox faith going in this direction, and you get the Western church, um, the Catholic church, going in this direction. Two different faiths now. However, one thing critical here is that both of those churches still had apostolic succession. So all the way back here, Peter chooses, or the, the, you know, the group of, of, of Christians at the time with Peter as Pope, choose the second Pope, who chooses the third, who chooses the fourth, and they continue. And even at this point, then, when the leadership split, they continued an apostolic succession throughout. So you can trace the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church all the way back to Peter, and they have that apostolic succession. As a result, um, we believe in the Catholic Church that the Orthodox liturgy, their version of the Mass, is valid. So that when the priest, an Orthodox priest, consecrates the bread and wine, it truly becomes the body and blood of Christ, just as it does in the Catholic Church. So we believe that that is valid. And that's really important to, to recognize, because even though we're not the same faith as them, because they have the roots all the way back to apostolic, through apostolic succession, the Mass is valid in either faith. And I'll talk more a little bit about that in a second. All right, so you with me so far? Okay with the split? All right, so now what happens is this. They go along for a while, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in the Reformation. The Reformation, of course, what happens is here we are in the 16th century, early 1500s, 1517, and Martin Luther and King Henry and all those kind of things start to go <laughs> on, and next thing you know, the Catholic Church starts to splinter. And so all of a sudden, we have the Anglican Church that develops, which is really the, the, um, the Church of England, if you will, that King Henry established. And that became kind of the Anglican Church, which eventually evolved into the Episcopal Church back here. That branch took off, and so did the Protestant branch that Martin Luther started. And then lots of other things happened, but this continued to split. Today, I don't have this on the graph, but it'd be cool to show it. Today, this branch right here has split 33,000 ways. Okay, there are 33,000 different Protestant churches. So you can kind of see what happened after the 16th century. This all just blew up. But the Catholic Church remained exactly the same. There was a split that happened, but we're still the same. However, what happens then is um, after there's a split and after the Reformation, as part of the kind of the, in the, in this Counter Reformation time, some of the Catholic or some of the um, Orthodox churches that had split from the Catholic Church changed their minds and decided, you know what, we want to be reunited with the Catholic Church. So beginning in about the year 1600, give or take, some of these Orthodox churches started to reunite with the Catholic Church. And when they did, they formed different rites, different ways of celebrating the liturgy, but they're back in union again with Rome. So even though they used to be Orthodox, they are now Catholic because they left the church and then they came back. Does that make sense? Now, one of the other things that's going on at the same time was back in 1545, the Council of Trent happened. This was a big uh, council of the Catholic Church, and it was a counter-Reformation thing. It was, okay, the Reformation is going on. What are we going to do here? We've got to define who we are. And at the Council of Trent, a decision that was made was everybody in the world that's Catholic has to celebrate Mass exactly the same way. There is going to be one Roman rite that everybody does. But they said, if you had a local tradition, all the way back here, some local tradition that happened, it got set up more than 200 years ago, they set that as the benchmark. If you have a local way of celebrating the liturgy that you've been celebrating for over 200 years, you can continue to celebrate the Mass that same way. So all of these kind of groups back here that were celebrating the liturgy a little bit different breathed a sigh of relief and said, cool, we can keep doing what we've always done. And we're still every bit as much Catholic as we were before. So even though we have this one red line going on here, we have the Western Rites, 
we have the Eastern Rite that came from the Orthodox coming back, and within this Rite, we have several others that were traceable all the way back to here that were approved at the Council of Trent. Is that confusing or is that making some sense? You doing okay? Okay, so bottom line is, all of a sudden here we are today, and today the Catholic Church has a Western Rite and it has all of the, these Eastern Rites. Rites that either are continuations of things that started very early on in a local way, or ones that came from uh, Orthodox who rejoined the church. And so there is not just one way to celebrate Mass. There are multiple ways of doing it. Each one of those is its own right, its own way of doing things. Now, no question about it, throughout the entire world, the Roman or Latin rite is by far the most common. What we experience here, and if you go across Western Europe, whether you're in France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, etc., you're going to see that same rite everywhere. Same thing, Australia, etc. It's going to be the same rite. But there are variations to that, locally and around the world. So, um, the Catholic Catechism of the Church says this, from the first community of Jerusalem until the Perusia, the end of time, it's the same Paschal mystery that the churches of God, faithful to the apostolic faith, notice that uh, apostolic succession, celebrate in every place. The mystery celebrated in the liturgy is one, but its forms of celebration are diverse. And that prompted Pope St. John Paul II back in 1995 in one document that he wrote. He said the church must breathe with both of her lungs. That's the imagery he gave. We have the western lung and the eastern lung, and we breathe with both of those. So we have kind of that western feel that comes from the Roman or the Latin rite, but we also have some of the traditions of the church that are kind of preserved in that eastern rite. And in reality, for a lot of the eastern rite liturgies, it looks more like it did back in the first thousand years than it does today. Does that make sense? In other words, if you go to an Eastern Rite church, then what the priest is doing at that liturgy is actually more like it was back in the first thousand years than it's become since then. Um, so, but there's a combination of both of those things. I think John Paul recognized that we have to have, have both of those pieces. So those liturgical rites, this is from the Catholic Catechism, it says that they presently in use in the church are the Latin Rite and then other rites of the local churches. And so specifically, it points out seven different rites. The Latin or Roman rite, Byzantine, Alexandrian or Coptic, Syriac, Armenian, Maronite, and Chaldean rites. And it says, in faithful obedience to tradition, the Sacred Council declares that the Holy Mother Church holds all lawfully, lawfully recognized rites to be of equal right and dignity, and she wishes to preserve them in the future and to foster them. So, yep. so this is a, a list of the different rites that are pointed out here in the um, Catechism of the Church. And what they do is give a short kind of paragraph description of different, all of the different rites that are mentioned in the Catechism and kind of where they came from or why they exist as of today. We have rites that, that um, developed, for example, uh, primarily in Egypt. Um, again, these were kind of like regional rites that developed in those first thousand years that have been preserved since then. Some of the rites are ones that were Orthodox and then came back to the Catholic Church, and so they got established a little differently too. But these are different ways of celebrating the liturgies, different traditions. Lucia, do you want to put any accent on the Maronite rite as long as we're there? Wait, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so your dad is a subdeacon in, in yeah. the Maronite rite. Correct. And that's what you grew up in, right? Mm -hmm. So, um... <laughs> what are the major differences that you notice? Okay, well, in Mass, um, a lot of it's spoken in Arabic. Um, the host is only given five months. So it's dipped in the wine and then dipped by ten. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll actually go into some of that okay. detail in a minute. Cool. Um, we can discuss this stuff. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that it was mostly in Arabic, though. That's kind of it. That's interesting. Um, yeah, there, I mean, like, at my church, we do, like, kind of, like, English, like, English heavier side in the morning and then, like, more Arabic in, like, the later. Mm -hmm. So we have two masses. One is more English and one is more Arabic. But, like, yep. a lot of the churches remain, like, 
Good, good, thank you. So I'll come back and I want to ask you a few other questions in a, in a little bit. Um, so there, there are, um, there, one, one of the things to, to think about here, some of the churches that um, were not united with the Catholic Church but then came back, uh, Maronite is not one of them. You never left the church, right? Maronite has always been part of the Catholic Church. It's one of those different traditions in that first thousand years. Um, but some of them, and on your list there, it talks about the Byzantine Rite. The Byzantine Rite, which is one of the Eastern Rites, is the most commonly practiced rite other than the Latin Rite in our country, and pretty much across the world um, in terms of numbers of people. But look at the list here. The Byzantine Rite in includes Albanian, Belu uh, Belarusian, Bulgarian, Byzantine, Greek Byzantine, Hungarian, etc. All these different variations. Notice, by the way, that they have ethnic differences. So that's not unusual because we think about that. That's why they cropped up the way that they did, is that in Greece, the way they were celebrating the liturgy might have been slightly different from the way they were celebrating it in Russia or Romania. And each one of those kind of developed its own little culture of what the church looks like. And so they looked really different. Then all of a sudden, those churches split off from the Catholic Church in the Orthodox tradition, but then they came back to the Catholic Church. So actually, virtually every church on this list, this is where it gets really confusing, virtually every church on this list has an Orthodox branch and a Catholic branch because they didn't all come back. So for example, there is a Greek Orthodox church, but there is also the Greek Catholic church. There is a Russian Orthodox church and there's a Russian Catholic church. So that's a little bit confusing because not all of the Russian churches came back. Some did and some didn't. The Russian church didn't come back to the Catholic church until 1917. They've only been around 100 years. They waited 400 years longer than the rest of them did before they came back. But not all of them did because there still is a Russian Orthodox as well as a, as a Russian Catholic church. Um, so if we think about that diagram going back, think about that split with the Anglican and Episcopal church going off that way. Can you picture that again? All right, so you've got these this one branch that splits two ways, and then you've got another branch that splits off of a branch and goes in its own direction. When they go in their own direction like that, it means they're no longer associated with Rome and they're no longer Catholic. The Episcopal or Anglican Church is not in any way associated with the Catholic Church anymore. Therefore, if you go to an Episcopal Church or an Anglican Church on a Sunday, it does not count as your Sunday obligation. That's the answer to one of your questions that you answered in the beginning. Okay, so an Episcopal Anglican Church does not count. You gotta be careful about that because they look a lot like a Catholic Mass. In fact, I went to one church, this, was, this has been quite a few years ago, but I went to a church when I was on vacation one time that was, the church sign said Anglican Catholic Church. I thought, that's interesting. I thought all Anglican churches were not Catholic, but I thought, well, I'll go to Mass anyway, why not? And I did. And it wasn't until it was over, because Mass looked a lot like a Catholic Mass, and it was over, I realized that was truly an Anglican church. They just used the word Catholic to mean universal, but not that they're really Catholic. And I realized, oh, I actually didn't go to Mass at all. I thought I did. <laughs> it looked like it, but it wasn't. So the Anglican and Episcopal traditions look a lot like the Catholic Church, but they're not, and it doesn't count. Um, Toledo area, there are two Byzantine Rite churches. One of them is a Ruthenian Catholic church, and it is in Oregon, Ohio. Um, it is a small church. In fact, it's small enough. Both of these churches are pretty small, but that one I got a real quick story about, I got to tell you. It's a, <laughs> it's a small church, and I go there every once in a while because I love going to, to uh, uh, the other rites down there. And the last time I was there, there were probably, I don't know, 50 or 100 of us at Mass, something like that. It was, you know, and it was their only Mass of the weekend, so it's a small congregation. And the priest is doing the, the prayers of the faithful, right? And he's chanting them. And he says, you know, for the universal church and for Pope Francis, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. And then he says, and for the one visitor we have with us today. <laughs> and everybody looked at me and went, yeah, we <laughs> know. Okay, he came up with that one off the top of his head. He looked around and went, who's that guy? <laughs> Crawled under the pew in this room. 
Now, having said that, I know in his heart he meant the best, right? I mean, he was reaching out and saying, how cool is it that you came to visit? But for me, it was like, how mortified do I feel? <laughs> so anyway, so beware. If you go to that church, you might get the same treatment. It's really a wonderful place. And actually, we had a good talk after Mass because um, he said, you were singing so loud during Mass. I said, I love to sing. He said, you should become a member here. We'd like to have that voice. <laughs> I've already got things to do. Um, the other one uh, in the Toledo area is a Ukrainian Catholic church. The Ukrainian Catholic Church, St. Michael's, is located in Rossford, which is just a short drive from here. Um, the pastor there, Father George, was there for many years. He's now kind of semi-retired, so they've had a visiting priest coming in. Very small community. Um, they have um, mass twice a weekend, 4.30 on Saturdays and 9.30, I think it is, on Sunday mornings. And I go there fairly frequently. Also, although I haven't been there for a while, I'm a little bit busy at St. Tom's. Um, but I get there when I can. And... Um, it's, a, it's a small church, but also, again, in that, um, that Eastern uh, tradition that just looks different from the liturgy that we, we would see it here. So, what about Orthodox liturgies? Canon law says this, whenever necessity requires it, or true spiritual advantage suggests it, and provided the danger of error of indifferentism, in other words, that I don't really care which church I go to, is avoided, the Christian faithful for whom it's physically or morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister are permitted to receive penance, Eucharist, anointing of the sick from non-Catholic ministers in those churches where those sacraments are valid. The sacrament of the Eucharist is valid in an Orthodox church. So basically what that canon is telling us is if you're away on a trip and you want to go to Mass on a Sunday morning and there's not a Catholic church anywhere that you can physically get to, but there happens to be an Orthodox church down the street, you're allowed to go to their, their mass and count it as your Sunday obligation. However, if you do that, um, you are supposed to ask permission by the priest before mass to receive communion. Because we're allowed to receive communion only if the priest approves it. That's different than the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church says if an Orthodox visitor comes to our church on a Sunday, they are free to come forward and receive communion because it's the same communion they receive, it's valid. But they don't see it the same way. They look at it as, you're welcome to come, but talk to us first if you're really planning on receiving communion. And so there's kind of a, an agreement there that we have to do that. So my wife and I, three years ago, we were in Greece, we were on the island of Crete for the day. It was a Sunday, and there was a Greek, big Greek, or Greek Orthodox church. It was St. Titus. St. Titus, the guy that, you know, Paul's letter to Titus, and um, his skull is, um, in, is um, not displayed, it's actually in an ornamental thing anyway, in that church, which is just a, an incredible shrine in there. Um, and so my wife and I kind of threw in the towel and said, I guess we're going to go to Mass here um, until we did a little bit more digging and found out, by golly, they do have a Catholic church in town. Um, and so we went there. It was, the Mass was said in Greek, but it was a Catholic church uh, in our tradition, even with our, the Latin rite, but being said in Greek. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so the answer to your question about if you go to an Orthodox church, does it count? The answer is it depends. It depends. It doesn't necessarily count. But I think this, this canon is very um, carefully worded. Necessity requires it. There's no physical way that you could get to a Catholic church, then that option is available to you. Okay? Um, so Lucia was talking about a few contrasts. Here are just a few. You know, people oftentimes ask, what's the difference between going to a liturgy in the East versus the West? So just a few in general. Um, in the West, we refer to our liturgy as the Mass. In the East, they call it the Divine Liturgy. So you'll see this on Eastern churches. It'll say Divine Liturgy is, served at, or is um, celebrated at 4.30. Divine Liturgy means Mass in that, in that lingo. Um, we pray the Nicene Creed. In the East, they have a little trouble with that. They, we have this issue, um, filioque. <laughs> you guys heard of that? Okay, so let's just examine that for a second. Back in the 13th century, after the Great Schism had happened. Do you notice something different there? What do you notice? Uh, the lack of words in the Son after the uh, Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father. Exactly, exactly. Go down to the bottom there where it says, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, proceeds from the Father, who together with the, where's the end, Son part? Okay? This was one of the sticking points between the East and the West that caused the schism to happen. And you wouldn't think that one little thing like that would matter, but it wasn't little to them at the time, and it still isn't today, and that's why they haven't changed the words. 
because the, the belief of the Western Church was and is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Bishop Barron often talks about that the Father is the lover, the Son is the beloved, and the love they share with one another is the Spirit. And so you have to have the Father and the Son to share that Spirit. And so the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the Eastern Church, they don't like that. Their, their belief is that the Spirit flows from the Father. And if you must say something more, then don't say, and the Son, say, through the Son. And so some have made that slight amendment, proceeds from the Father through the Son. But they prefer just to leave that out. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, period. A lot of battle went on about that, a lot of argument, and they never resolved it. And so that's one of the big reasons why the church split, among others, but in terms of a, a theological point. So it wasn't until about 200 years after the schism that the Catholic Church in the West finally said, we're going to just add the Holy Spirit in there to make it clear. And the Eastern Church said, we're not going to add it to heart of the Son. And the Eastern Church said, we're not going to add that. We don't believe that. And so when you pray the creed, the Eastern Church doesn't say it, the Western does. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of a minor point, but it's there. It's been a point of, of contention. It still is to this day. And the best agreement they can come to is if you would just say through the Son, we'd be okay. And, and the Western Catholics say, no, we're not going to say that. They proceed from both. Okay, we just have to agree, agree to this. We'll leave that up to the theologians. Um, in the Western Church, we typically see statues in the church. We have some of those at St. Tom's. The Eastern Church tends to have icons, like this one I'm showing down here. Um, icons, painted pictures um, of the saints and, and various um, scenes from the, from the Bible. In the West, priests are celibate and remain single. In the West and the East, they can be married. Um, because in the tradition of the church, priests were, were married until about the 13th century. You know, uh, the idea of a celibate priest is relatively new in church history, which is within the last 700 years or so. Up until that time and up until the point where the, the schism happened, priests were married. Um, St. Peter was married, right? We know from scripture that Jesus um, um, healed her, his mother-in-law. And so, I mean, we know that he was married. So right down through the church for that first thousand years, priests were married. They remain with that same tradition in the East that the priests are allowed to be married. Um, and so whether it's an Orthodox church or it's a Catholic Eastern Rite church, priests are permitted to be married. We've seen that a lot in the news right now, that whole Amazon discussion thing about whether priests should be married, and that's another matter. Um, in the West, we use unleavened bread because that's what the um, Israelites used at the, at the uh, Passover, but in the East, they use leavened bread. They don't think it's a big deal whether the bread is, is leavened or not. Um, in the West, we receive communion, um, bread, and, and the consecrated wine. And as Lucia was saying, in the East, bread and wine together. And so the tradition is to, uh, in the Eastern Rite, is to consecrate the bread in little cubes, to put those cubes in the cup. And then when you come to communion, the priest will take a spoon and spoon out one of those cubes that's, that's sitting in the, in the consecrated wine. You basically turn your head back, stick your tongue out, and he drops it with the spoon onto your tongue. So it's a very different way of receiving communion. Um, and that just was the custom, right? So you receive that together with a spoon. It's a different way of receiving. Um, also, in the Orthodox Church, something else that they do, was, which is a carryover from the first um, thousand years, is, uh, I talked about this at, the, at night of worship a couple weeks ago, or last month, I guess it was, that um, in the early church, it was kind of common that when Mass was over, you would take uh, some of the consecrated bread home. Because you take it home so you can sort of eat a little piece of it all week long and stay united with the church, and then we decided that's not a very good idea. Um, and the Orthodox Church decided the same thing. It's not a good idea. So what they do in the Orthodox tradition is they have an unconsecrated loaf of bread cut up, up into little cubes. And when you go up and receive communion in the Orthodox Church, then you go by a basket and you pick up a piece of bread and you take it back with you, and you either share it with a friend or take it home with you. That's still part of their tradition. It's not consecrated, it's just a piece of bread. So my wife, my wife and I went to an Orthodox liturgy a couple years ago because it was part of my formation as a deacon. Um, interviewed the priest and the deacon afterwards. It was a really beautiful day. Um, but you know, we couldn't receive communion because we're not in communion with the Orthodox Church and we had the option to go to a Catholic Church that day and we did. Um, but I went forward anyway and received one of those you know, unconsecrated pieces of bread. It's a sign of unity and anybody can do that. Um, in the West, we baptize infants 
and then we generally do First Communion in second grade, and then we do Confirmation when you're in like seventh and eighth grade. In the Eastern Church, all three of them are, are um, given to an infant. So when your child is a couple months old, a few weeks old, take the child to church, they are baptized, confirmed, and receive Eucharist all at the same time. The Eucharist is the precious blood, because at that age, children are not capable of eating the bread, so generally there's a little bit of the precious blood on a spoon that they put into the child's uh, mouth, and they receive all three of those sacraments at once. Very different from the way we do it, but there, in the Eastern Church, the belief is these are the three sacraments of initiation, David. So because of the... <laughs> I should have asked it first. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> so because they're, they're part of the, of the, they are the sacraments of initiation, the belief is let's initiate the child. Let's give him or her all three of those sacraments at the same time. Okay, so um, I want to just pull up a piece of video with you for a minute. There is There are many of these online. This is just an example. This is a, uh, an, um, an Eastern Rite, Byzantine Rite church in Barberton. Anybody from near the Akron area? Okay, so, <laughs> there you go. so this church is actually in Barberton. And just give you a little bit of feel, I'm gonna just talk you through a couple of things here. You get a chance to see it. For those of you particularly that haven't been to You won't be able to see that. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the divine liturgy. And you notice the priest begins by, first of all, you notice that there is a curtain drawn and also doors closed to the sanctuary, so you can't see the altar. All of the icons here, as opposed to statues that we talked about, lots of incense. Okay, Olivia, I think you're the one that I told. I talked to. A, right priest one time, or actually he was a bishop, who told me that if you can still see the altar, you haven't used enough incense. <laughs> so, lots of incense. So, first and foremost, the priest is coming out, he's processing, he's incensing. There's an icon here in the, in the, in the front, he's going to incense the icon. Incense the people. And when the people make the sign of the cross, you notice a little something different there too. All right, in the Eastern Rite, you don't make the sign of the cross the way we do. You make the sign of the cross from your forehead to your chest to your right, and then back to your chest. And oftentimes three times, and you'll notice that in this liturgy that they'll make the sign of the cross like this three times. So it goes right to center instead of left to right. Just a different way of doing it. There's not one way of making the sign of the cross. It's different in the East than it is in the West. It means the same thing. One other observation I'll share with you here. When my wife and I went to the Orthodox Church a couple years ago during my formation, um, I will tell you that the Orthodox liturgy that we attended was exactly like what you're seeing here. Exactly. Like, if you walked in there, you would not know, is this a Catholic church or is this an Orthodox church? And the reason you don't know the difference is that they are the same, right? Because if it's a, a Russian Orthodox and a Russian Catholic, it's the same rite, the same background, the same everything, except one's united with Rome and is Catholic and the other one is not. So they celebrate exactly the same liturgy. And I remember when that started, I was expecting something weird and different. And I had been enough to the Eastern Rite Masses, I started sitting there, I turned to my wife and I said, we, we've done this before, this looks really familiar. Um, and I started realizing, well, it's the, it's the Mass of St. John Chrysostom. St. John actually wrote that liturgy, and that same liturgy is being celebrated in the Orthodox Church as it is in the Eastern Catholics. So um, Byzantine Rite and the Orthodox Rite are the same thing. So um, you would not know if you weren't told which, which um, church you were in. Until, by the way, you pray later and you pray for the Pope, and you realize, okay, we are in a different different spot here. You will incense the icon of Christ and of Mary.
curtains drawn, the doors are open. <coughs> so now the emphasis goes on the altar rather than the icons. <laughs> Notice that the priest is facing away from us, which we see in the saw in the Catholic Church prior to the Second Vatican Council. So the priest is facing in the same direction the congregation is facing, which he's therefore facing away from them during the, the entire liturgy, except when the readings are being read and for some of the blessings. Bola see the kingdom of the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Pray to the Lord. For peace from harm and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Now at this point you're thinking, we don't do that at our Mass, but we do do the Lord have mercy, right? I mean, that's, that's part of our right, but the way that they do it, interspersing it with intercessions, feels different than the way we do it. And that's what you'll find if you watch the entire thing through. Um, that the liturgy mirrors what we do. There's the liturgy of the Word, and there's the liturgy of the Eucharist. There's opening prayer, there are closing prayers, there's a final closing breath, blessing. That looks the same. This liturgy is an hour and 15 minutes. That's a little longer than ours, okay? Um, but this particular liturgy has a lot of the chanting of the choir. Um, I know that at the Ukrainian church in, in Rossford, there are liturgies where uh, the choir sings is a little bit longer. There are other more spoken liturgies that go a little bit faster. Uh, if you will, but their liturgy is usually an hour um, or a little bit more. So, um, I'm just going to kind of go through here a little bit. So here um, is the, are the readings. Not with the blood of goats and calves, Notice, by the way, that the readings here are chanted rather than read. Eternal redemption. <coughs> He's reading the first reading. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a heifer's ashes can sanctify those who... And so on. The priest will do the same. A second time he bent down and rolled on the ground. Then the audience Drifted away one by one, beginning with the elders. This left him alone with a woman who continued to stand there before him. So the woman Jesus caught in adultery, he's telling reading that gospel story and he's chanting. Woman, where did they all disappear to? No one, has no one condemned you? No one's heard, she answered. And so forth. Then he preaches, so it's the homily just as we have it. We are not coming home to some goal. We will be not experiencing. But I will tell you this, having gone through this video in detail, the homily is 18 minutes long, which is twice the average of how long Father Jason and I preach, so be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so he preaches for a while and then we see, again, the same kind of things that we would see here. The gifts are prepared at the altar. The Eucharistic prayer is being said. And so on. And then eventually... Consecration happens, and then we're at communion at some point here. I'm not losing it. Here are people going to communion. Notice that he's got the spoon in his hand. He's putting the Eucharist in their mouths with the spoon. Then when communion is over, he returns to the altar and basically closes Mass the same way that we're familiar with. The prisoner, the fall is your church, sanctify those who have the beauty of house. Glorify them with her by divine power and not forsake us who hope in you. Grant peace to your world, your church is a peace over government and all your people. For all children has given and ever perfect in this world now. Coming down from the Father of lights and we give glory, thanks, devotion to you. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and forever. Amen. Then he gives the final blessing. Okay, so you see how in general it looks really different, but it does follow the same order. It's just done in a different way. It's a different way of celebrating liturgy. I think that's a, the best way to make sense of what a different rite means. But it's just so celebrated differently. Yes. Is there a reason that they chant the reading? Um, no, it's it's optional. And actually, you know, in the in the Latin Roman rite that we celebrate, the option is there to chant the readings too. Um, we don't typically here, but there are churches that do. Um, so in the in the um, Eastern Rite, it's optional, just as it is in the Western Rite, but they're more likely to chant it because they tend to chant a lot of things, um, whereas in the West, we're less likely to do it. You know, even in the in the new Roman Missal, or the current Roman Missal, Missal we have the, um, the option to chant the creed as well. Some congregations do that. They actually chant it in a monotone oftentimes. I believe in God, the Father, and the Almighty, the Creator of it. You just, you know, it with one, one note. So we have the option to do that. It's just that in the West, we usually don't. In the East, they usually do. But uh, So that makes kind of makes it distinct. You notice how much chanting goes on there. Chanting and incense and lots of icons. You know, very typical of the, of the whole thing. A um, couple of final words here, and I want to have you have a, a short discussion um, about it. Um, question often comes up about saints and what that looks like in, in the East and the West. Important to think, to think about this that until the schism happened in 1054, we were all one church. So any saint who was canonized as, as a saint prior to the year roughly 1100 is shared in the Orthodox and in the East and in the West. They're common saints. So a good example of that, I think, is St. Cyril and Methodius. They were Slavic, um, and they are big heroes in the Eastern Church. And so the Orthodox faith, faith honors them as great saints of the church, and so do we in the Catholic Church, because they were around in, in the, about the 6th, 7th century, so it was before the schism ever happened. Same thing with somebody like St. Basil or St. John Chrysostom. They were uh, already saints before the schism happened. After that time, so, so oh yeah, and then um, since that time, the Latin and Eastern Rite share the same saints. So we oftentimes get that question, um, is a saint in the Eastern Rite also a saint in the Western Rite? Yes, because we're all Catholic and we're all under Rome. So as long as it's a Catholic church, it doesn't matter which rite it is, we share all the same people. But there are some subtle differences. For example, on December 27th, you might know what we celebrate feast day on, on December 27th? St. John the Evangelist. But in the Eastern Rite, they celebrate um, the feast of St. Stephen. We celebrate St. Stephen on the 26th. They celebrate him on the 27th. Why? Well, because they have a different tradition than we do. But the fact is, they have the same saints. They may honor them in different ways on different days, but the saints are the same. Um, the Orthodox Church does not have a way of formally canonizing a saint. In the Orthodox Church, they just say, if somebody is a martyr or is a great person, we all recognize that as a great person, we're going to start calling them saints. But there really is no process that they go through for somebody to be canonized. So there have been many saints named in the Orthodox Church since the schism, but we don't recognize them as saints in the Catholic Church because they've never officially gone through a canonization process. So it's kind of interesting that way that they're, you know, some that are shared before the schism, but not all. If you're looking for any writings to read that have that Eastern flair to them, this is the best book to get. It's called the Philokalia. And what it is, it's well known in the Orthodox Church and in, and, and in the Eastern Church as well, the Philokalia is a collection of hundreds and hundreds of sayings and short paragraphs from various saints. Some of them Western saints that we share as Catholics, and some of them being Orthodox saints. But there's nothing heretical about reading them. In fact, there's some beautiful writing in there that came from some of these Orthodox saints as well. Um, so this is just one example from the Philokalia. This was actually from St. Maximus the Confessor. He says, he who truly loves God prays entirely without distraction. And he who prays entirely without distraction loves God truly. I love that. Think about that. Let that sink in. He whose intellect is fixed on any worldly thing does not pray without distraction, and consequently, he does not love God. So if we pray entirely without distraction, we love God. 
and if we pray, if we love God, we pray without distraction. It's just kind of a nice way. So Saint Maximus was seventh century. He was in the early six hundreds. Therefore, when he was declared a saint in the church, he was declared as a saint for everybody. So he is celebrated by the Orthodox, the Eastern Rite, the Western Church. He is a saint for everybody. Questions we want to we want to get out here. One question Max asked me just at the beginning of the discussion was about um, whether uh, the, the holy days are celebrated in general in the Eastern Church and Western Church on the same days. They are. Um, the Annunciation of, of Our Lady on March 25th is celebrated same in East and West. Um, you know, the Annunciation, the, the, um, uh, the Feast of the Assumption, all of those kind of feasts that we celebrate in the Western Church are celebrated exactly the same in the Eastern Church. The only difference is that there is a difference in emphasis in the East and West. So uh, an example would be the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. In the Byzantine Rite, that's a holy day of obligation. It's a huge high holy day. In the Catholic Church, we barely notice it. It's June 25th or 26th, and it's, it's there, but it's not um, held as, in, in as much reverence as it is in the Eastern Church. So. Uh, I was just going to say, um, we also do Ash Monday, not Ash Monday. Right, um, and, the, and the Great Fast. That's a different, yeah, a different so thing. Yeah, so there's no Fast Tuesday for us. <laughs> that Sunday. And do you know why that's true? Or why you do that? I remember asking like my dad, but I don't remember what the answer. So what I've read is, um, so ask your dad about this for her, okay? But but it's the it's how you count the forty days. Yes. Because if you in the Catholic tradition we don't count Sundays, and if you don't count Sundays, you have to start on Wednesday before the Monday because you got to get all those days in. Whereas in the um, Eastern Rite, you start on Monday because you don't have to start the previous Wednesday, you start on Monday because we're essentially doing Wednesday through Sunday to make up for all those Sundays that we're not going to celebrate Lent during Lent. Does that make any sense? Yes. Um, so, so that's kind of what's going on. It's like it's like delaying the start of Lent until Monday because you're going to count all 40 of those days. Where in the Catholic Church, we start the Wednesday before because Sundays are technically not part of Lent in the Western tradition. Uh, because the, the Western Church has always held that nothing gets in the way of Sunday. Sunday is a feast of uh, is a celebration of the feast of the resurrection, and because we celebrate Christ's resurrection, that is held in such esteem that nothing gets in the way. So even though we're in the middle of a penitential period of Lent, Sunday is still Sunday. It's a celebration of the resurrection, and it doesn't count as part of Lent. Um, okay, so that was one of the questions. The other, the other question um, we were talking about up here. Or, 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 gosh, I forget. Andrew. Oh, I know. So, so the, the question about um, I forget how you phrased it the first time. Uh, who split from home? Oh, who split from home? Right? Was it the Catholic split from the Orthodox? Right? We talked about how it's kind of related to just kind of a question of semantics. Because in reality, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church today are that close. They're really close. Uh, you've probably seen it in the news. The Patriarch from the Orthodox Church meets with Pope Francis, and there's pictures, photo ops all the time on, on television, because they're talking about how can we unify all of this into one, because we're that close. We share apostolic succession. We share a common liturgy in the Eastern Rite to the Orthodox Rite. It's so similar, we're not quite there. So the question that I asked the Orthodox priest when my wife and I visited their, their divine liturgy is I said, do you think in our lifetime that you'll ever see the Orthodox Church reunited in its entirety with the Catholic Church. And he immediately went, no, it ain't gonna happen. And I said, why isn't it gonna happen? I loved his answer about this, it was very interesting. He said, think of it this way. In the Catholic Church, you have the Catholic Church. In the Orthodox, we have the Russian Orthodox, and the Ukrainian Orthodox, and the Greek Orthodox, and the Bulgarian Orthodox. He said, we have so many cultural differences right there we can't even pull our own church together into one. How would we ever reunite with the Catholic Church? He said, really, if we're going to have a discussion about reuniting, we need to have a conversation of how do we at least get the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox on the same page. And if we can't even get on our own same page, there's no way we're going to rejoin the Catholic Church. Does that make sense? That's kind of an interesting answer. I never thought about that before. Because we don't have those ethnic differences. You know, we don't have the, the um, you know, Brazilian Catholic Church and the French Catholic Church. We don't operate that way. You're either Catholic or you're not, kind of. There are certainly cultural differences here and there, but our liturgy and our rites are all the same. Um, other than, again, those differences we talked about today. Any, anything else? Uh, other questions? 
Okay. Does the Orthodox Church like follow the same reading schedule as like? Reading? No, it doesn't. Thanks for asking that. The Orthodox and the Eastern do not follow the same readings. So <clears throat> the, uh, the lectionary, remember back with that slide that talked about how a different rite means you have a different ecclesial setup, which means the different way the church is set up? The Eastern Church is free to set up their own way of structuring the lectionary, and they don't use the same lectionary as in the West. So you can go into any Western Catholic Church in the world, and we'll be doing the exact same three readings on that weekend. But if you go into an Eastern Church, they'll be doing different readings. Unless some coincidence happens, which obviously that can happen now and then, but, but by and large, it is a separate lectionary on a different schedule, and it does not match the West. That throws me off every time, because I'm kind of preparing the Sunday before, and I go to the Byzantine Rite, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, what's he talking about? That's not the reading for today. It is for them, not for me. You know. So yeah, it's not on the same schedule. Thanks for asking. Anything else? Do they still do two readings and a gospel like yeah. us, or do they have Normally, that? yes. And your church does too, right? And you do a, two, two, two uh, scripture readings before the gospel? Uh, yes. <laughs> On a Sunday. Yeah, and we also, the priest blesses the reader. So we like, they ask like, Father, you know, Father, you know, like, <laughs> Ironically. I know, well, I asked <laughs> Put him on. Um, <laughs> 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 yes, hi, how are you? <laughs> what is this, phone a friend? <laughs> <laughs> I do have a little surgical question. So I, we are at Catholic Falcon and there are 30-some people staring at me right now. I'm really waiting your answer. We're talking about Let's pray for Rachel, the who's on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, 23 rights, he says. Um, <laughs> Yes, that's right. So our question, our burning question right now is why do Maronites celebrate Ash Monday instead of Ash Wednesday? We are not the only, we are not the only one who celebrate on Monday. All Eastern churches celebrate it on Monday. The reason why we do that, because Lent starts after, after, uh, uh, Sun, after, uh, uh, Sunday. Right. Uh, start. Yeah. So after that, the Lent starts on Monday. It ends in 40, not 40 days from Sunday, it ends on Sunday of, of uh, uh, the Resurrection Sunday. Okay. <laughs> That's 40 days. But in the Roman Catholic Church, which is the oddball, the <laughs> 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 Eastern, Eastern Church before you was a Western. Okay. <laughs> it started in the Antioch, which is a, a modern Turkey. Right. Yeah. Okay, so wait, so then... <laughs> anyway, left wrong. Anyway, but the Western Church starts on, on Ash Wednesday, and they finish on a Wednesday right before the Holy Thursday. Oh, I got it. So on Thursday you're done. Gotcha. So we started early, but we finished on Sunday, Sunday of Holy Week. So you... And, uh, uh, the Roman Rite starts on Wednesday and finishes on a Wednesday right before the Holy Thursday. Gotcha. And so then <laughs> the like the um, Triduum is like just separate for Roman. Yeah, the Sunday because we don't fast on Sunday. Gotcha. Sunday is the day that you don't fast. It's mm -hmm. a it's a holy day. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> Do you have any other last words to put in for the Eastern Rite of the Church? <laughs> We are the first church. <laughs> so there you go. Huh? <laughs> Notice his response to that same question, Catherine. Sunday is a day of celebration. It's a day that we break the fast. So, you know, when you're going through Lent, um, technically, if you gave something up for Lent, you, don't, you can do it on Sunday. If you gave up cake, you can eat cake on Sunday, if you want. Our tradition in our family is you don't break the fast no matter what day it is, but technically in the church it says you can't do that. So. Um, I've also heard that one time my friend was very violent to me when I would break my fast on Sunday. She said basically it also like honors the day of rest, like when God created, and she was like, so God needs to rest and you don't, and 
I was like, so what do you need? And then she was like, we have to honor this as a day of rest, and the Lord recognizes that we need rest. Yeah, that's another discussion for another day. Um, <laughs> but I will just give you this. My favorite way that I've run across that, um, or that I've, I've prayed my way through that, um, reading uh, a book by N.T. Wright, who's a theologian, who wrote about, about that. And he said, we, we oftentimes misconstrue God rested on the seventh day to mean God sat in his armchair and kicked back and said, I'm done. And in reality, what he mean, what we mean is God rested in his creation. He, he, he rested in what he had created on that day. So to rest in something means to exist with it. And if you think of it that way, God spent six days creating the world, and the last day he rested in it. He looked at it and said, this is good, right? Everything is good. And so what we're called to do as Christians is to rest in that seventh day, to enjoy that seventh day. We enjoy it by eating the cake that we gave up for Lent. See, that's kind of the way of looking at it. So it isn't, just a, it isn't just strictly a matter of taking a rest. It is resting in God's creation, spending time being in God's creation. On that note, thank you all for coming tonight. This has been a pleasure. Um, I appreciate all of your great questions and your interaction today. I think we have some announcements from the group. Then.